Okay, good morning everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here uh, on the screen. There are more than 250 people who are following us on our, our uh, network. Uh, as you know, today we have a great day. We are going to have a conversation with the Spanish Vice Minister of Economy, Nadia Calviño, and the Minister of Finance for Portugal, Fernando Medina, both of both of them are well known for you. I am not going to to your uh, to their CVs. You can you can have an hour in, in our call for for the conversation, uh, and they are going to talk about Europe and economics in Europe. Let me just begin by uh, raising two or three topics that I believe that they are going to deal in their conversation. The first one is uh, optimist note, and the optimist note is very clear. Define all doomsayers, the EU economies, the UK is another story, are perform performing much better than expected. According to European Commission estimates, growth in 2022 has exceeded 3%, more than half a percentage point above the summer forecast. Unemployment is at record low of 6.5% and industrial production has fallen much less than expected. Although growth is projected to decelerate in 2023, unlike previous crises, the COVID and the global financial crisis and the euro crisis of 2008-2012, this economic deceleration, if it occurs, it's likely to be mild and brief. And both Portugal and Spain are very much likely to weather it, not to have a recession as expected last year. The key, the takeaway is very clear. The European economy is withstanding the shock of the post-COVID 
and the Russian invasion of Ukraine much better than expected. Moreover, the Union and its member states has put in place effective measures to avoid a recession and reduce the impact of inflation on citizens and business. EU countries have made good and quick economic and energy policy decisions. First, an expansionary fiscal policy which has been implementing to cash on the blow of rising energy prices. In addition to the substantial investment of the next generation EU programs, which are progressing well, all governments have taken measures to protect the most vulnerable citizens and business. This has ensured that investment and consumption have not been drastically reduced, although it also must be stressed that such supports cannot be sustained indefinitely. In the medium term, this raised the important question of how we are going to redesign the fiscal rule of our monetary union. Secondly, monetary policy, although tighter than in the past, has remained expansionary, with the US Federal Reserve much more aggressive in tightening liquidity the euro has depreciated against the dollar, and this has also helped us to keep growth at positive rates. Moreover, and this is very important, the rise in interest rate has now led to substantial reduction in credit, bank balance sheets, problems, or a housing market crash. The downside has been the persistence of inflation, although, uh, as I am sure they are going to comment in, in a minute, Inflation is going down very quickly and much quickly, much faster than expected. And third, which has also important public policies, to replace Russian gas with liquefied natural gas, they, we, Europe has been able to find alternative suppliers and to put in place energy savings measures which have worked relatively well. Besides that, Portugal, Portugal and Spain, thanks to the Iberian exception, has been able to shield consumers from the rising price in world uh, gas markets. They have been a much more and wider uh, set of topics and public policies uh, on the European climate response. In fact, much, uh, some of them has gone much farther than these price control and these, price, these supplies change and has entered the realm of geopolitics. In addition to the Repower EU package, the, UE, the European Union agreed an embargo on Russian coal and oil, agreed a price cap on Russian oil export, and after intense negotiation, reach an historic decision to jointly buy 50% of its gas in 2023. They have also uh, changed and transformed the emission trade scheme and launched an interesting and long-lasting debate on the carbon burden adjustment mechanism. I think this is extremely important and I will end with a, another note of optimism. Despite slowing economic growth, despite rising interest rate, and despite Eurocritical far-right movements uh, in Italy, there had not been any signs of financial fragmentation in the Eurozone, or tension in the financial markets that could trigger sovereign debt problems. Indeed, the mechanism put in place to prevent financial crisis in the Eurozone over the past decade, to the, together with the role that the ECB is playing in recent years as a lender of large resorts, seems to have convinced investors that the single currency is here to stay, and that it's an extremely important asset that Europe also has. Well, this is the context in which Nadia Calviño and Fernando Medina will discuss the economic challenge facing Europe. Uh, I guess that they will have a special focus on the effectiveness, fairness, and sustainability of public support to families and companies. 
the urgency of growth enhancing policies that promote Europe's competitiveness, the reform of economic governance framework and the priorities that Spain and Portugal can have for the Spanish presidencies which will take place and also all of you know in the second half of 2023. Uh, this is the conversation that I think the frame of the conversation we are going to have. I will ask to all of you, both in the in the audience and in the in the screen, that if you have any question, please send us to actividades@realcano.org or via Twitter using the hashtag of the event, which is Economic Priorities 2023. And now it's an incredible pleasure to give the floor to Nadia to start the conversation. Nadia, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, José Juan. Muchas gracias, Alcano, por organizar este evento. Bienvenido, querido Fernando, bienvenido. Eh, es muy extraño que tengamos que tener este debate en inglés especialmente siendo yo gallega, <risa> pero eh, probablemente eh, es más oportuno porque todos estos temas que vamos a hablar los vamos a tener que eh, defender y negociar en inglés. And so we start rehearsing with this conversation amongst our friends, amongst uh, friends, uh, I was going to say family more than friends, uh, really. I think this is an extremely interesting and timely uh, conversation. It's a great opportunity that you have come to, to Spain. It's the first time you visit this ministry. It's the first time we meet bilaterally. We see each other almost uh, every month. Uh, and, and we, of course, exchange uh, intensely every time we meet. We meet in Brussels or in Washington or in, in Luxembourg. But I think it's extremely timely that we have this exchange uh, and I was reflecting as, as Jose Juan was speaking on, on why did I think that this was the right time for this conversation. And I think that Portugal and Spain are closer than ever. This has been my feeling for the past almost five years since I became a minister back in Spain. Maybe because we are, uh, have uh, progressive governments, both in, in Portugal and Spain. It is clear that Prime Minister Costa and President Sánchez get along very well, and they are two very uh, well-respected leaders in Europe and, and beyond that uh, are bringing the two governments and thus the two countries you know, as closer uh, as possible. I was also thinking that as uh, the attention is varying to the east, to our eastern border, and when we see the images of the European Commission meeting the Ukrainian government only a couple of days ago, last uh, Thursday, Friday, one uh, becomes increasingly aware that the focus of, of attention is tending towards, it's moving towards the eastern border. I want to defend the importance of Iberia. Eh? And I want to uh, defend the importance of Portugal and Spain and this southwestern part of Europe also as a bridge to Africa and a bridge to America. I will come back to this in a moment. And two countries that are obviously having a key role in um, the most important, the uh, substantive uh, debates which are taking place right now and ultimately on the de de decision on where uh, is Europe going? What kind of Europe do we want for future generations? I also think that it's very timely because we have been leading an economic policy which has been focusing on the people, a progressive uh, economic policy, uh, where we've been protecting the economy, supporting the most vulnerable parts of our society, and we can show a successful result of this economic policy uh, in terms of growth, in terms of a fast reduction of, of inflation, and obviously in terms of the reform of energy markets. You were referring, Jose Juan, to the Iberian solution. So I think that there are a lot of attention is going to be paid to the example of Portugal and Spain as we are approaching, finally, the reform of the European internal market rules for the energy markets. 
And then finally, it's very timely because indeed in the second part of the year, uh, one of the uh, two Iberian uh, countries, so Spain, will be having the presidency of the Council and therefore our views uh, will have a stronger role and we will be able to have a stronger influence on the European agenda. Thus, the interest of having these bilateral meetings so that we can exchange uh, with a bit more of time on the top priorities for our countries and for the European Union as a whole. We are going to have a chance to exchange uh, during the Q&A uh, um, uh, phase in, in a moment, part of, of our event. So let me just uh, open the, the, pave the way for this discussion and open the debate and the conversation Talking about the non-paper that Spain submitted last week to the European Union, talking about a green economy pact, which uh, contains most of the ideas that then the European Commission has also integrated in their own proposal. And so I think the non-paper submitted by Spain is very much aligned with the approach of the European institutions, but it's putting on the table the need for a holistic approach at this point in time. Many people are talking about the fiscal rules, others are focusing on the energy regulation. Many are saying, oh, the capital markets union, the banking union should be the top priority in order to have a green finance in the private sector. We are also discussing the uh, finance into Ukraine and the possible impact on the midterm review of the multi-annual multi financial framework. Many are also discussing how to maximize the impact of the next generation EU investment plan. And Portugal and Spain are, are two of the most advanced countries in the deployment of the investments of, and reforms of the uh, funded with the next generation EU uh, transfers and, and loans. But at the end of the day, and this is I think the core message I'd like to leave with you, we need to have a comprehensive, a holistic approach to all these issues. Because at the end of the day, uh, the debate has to start with the need for Europe to undertake massive public and private investments in order to uh, drive the twin green and digital transitions. And these uh, investments have to be undertaken at the European level, at the national level. And thus, we need a coherent approach when we're talking about the European budget, when we're talking about the national fiscal rules, when we're talking about state aid, so that, to put it uh, mildly, we do not throw the baby with the bathwater, so that we do not weaken our internal market, so that we do not weaken our euro, so that we do not weaken all those instruments that we've been building for the past 40 plus years, in this aim to uh, find the best possible responses to the current challenges. And we are at the challenging point in time. The geopolitical situation is, is uh, obviously very complex. Not only the, the war uh, at the border of the EU, also the uh, American, the US response with this Inflation Reduction Act that many portray as a neo-protectionistic kind of approach, the emergence of China, the uh, emergence and the reinforcement of a global south that requires and demands uh, a, a seat at the table and an important role in shaping the future uh, of the world uh, economy. And in this context, it's very important that we uh, start from the basis and continue to protect the essential elements that have made Europe successful uh, and brought, brought prosperity to citizens and, and companies throughout the whole continent. The internal market, uh, a rules-based international trade framework where Europe is obviously a, a, a superpower. Energy regulation, which uh, protects the internal market but ensures clean energy and cheap energy that can also support the competitiveness of European uh, companies. A state aid framework which is fit for purpose and protects and reinforces the level playing field within the, the EU and a coherent approach at European and national level that ensures sufficient green financing to support the twin green and digital transformations. This is, uh, in a nutshell, what we are uh, advocating at European level. Uh, I, it so happens that many of the most important files in this debate that will shape the architecture of the EU in the years to come will come to maturity, uh, to fruition under the Spanish presidency. 
And that's why we need to have a comprehensive and a coherent approach that allows us uh, to have a very successful second part of the year where uh, we have new fiscal rules which are fit for purpose, a new regulatory framework in the energy sector which is fit for purpose, a multi-annual financial framework which is fit for purpose, uh, you know, any one uh, individual file would in itself be a, a massive endeavor, so imagine what the Spanish presidency can uh, deliver if we are successful, as I am sure we will be. So let me close with this idea and with the gratitude to Portugal, because uh, I am quite sure that we will be able to work together to shape these priorities, to bring them to a successful outcome in the course of the year, and that we will be able once more, as in the past the descubridores of our two countries do, I will not say rule the seas or rule the world, but at least mark, uh, orient, shape the debates that are taking place at European level in order to make sure that the response to current challenges is, as was the response to the uh, crisis derived from the pandemic, based on the principles of unity, determination and solidarity, so that we build not only a stronger economy, but also a stronger society within our European Union. I'll leave you with this idea, and I'm very much looking forward to listening to you, dear Fernando. Gracias. Obrigada. Thank you very much, Nadia. Uh, now I will give the floor to Fernando Medina. He's an economist with a degree from the Porto School of Economics and a master from the University of Lisbon Institute of Economic and Management. And he was the mayor of Lisbon from 12, 2015 to 2021 and president of the Lisbon Metropolitan Area. Fernando, the floor is yours, Minister. Bon dia. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much, José Juan Ruiz, for your kind words and for organizing this event. It's a great pleasure for me to be in Madrid in the presence of a such distinguished audience. É um pouco estranho, de facto, ter que falar aqui em inglês. Uh, nós temos o português, o castelhano e o portunhol, que também se aguenta bem nestes debates mas teremos que ir treinando o inglês. Before move, moving forward, allow me to, to say a thank you to my dear friend Nadia for the invitation to visit Madrid. Portugal and Spain are more than very old neighbors. We are partners, we are allies, allies, and we are friends. And we share common values, and even in our difference, we share the will of working together. And it's clear that for two countries that joined the European Union in the same day or in the one day after another, we have a lot of address to make to the common goal of the raising of the European Union. Today, we face common challenges and our two governments and the two of us share the strong will to strength the European social model, the European Union, and our economies. I'm therefore honored to join you for this day of political discussion on how to deal with the common changes, challenges facing Europe, Portugal, and Spain. Ladies and gentlemen, we are just a few days away of the first anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. A year ago, we were recovering from a pandemic and planning for a new cycle of economic growth and reforms. None of us could imagine the consequences that Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine would come to inflict on our economies, the energy crisis, the rise in food prices and fears of food security, to the bout of inflation and the urgent need to support households and firms. From the experience of the last year, we can already take one important lesson. The European Union, both politically and economically, has once more proved its resilience under, even under such a severe shock. 
In the last 12 months, we were able to show remarkable political unity in supporting Ukraine while resisting to the political weaponization of energy from Russia. Second, we avoid a recession that was taken for granted for many. Third, we implement significant changes in the production, use and supply of energy across Europe. In this regard, Portugal and Spain have developed their own mechanism that effectively captured margins from the renewable energy production to the benefit of all consumers and a project that even now the European Union tries to reply to the rest of the Union. And fourth, we continue to strongly support households and firms in dealing with an inflationary crisis not seen in many decades. Allow me to share some information about the situation in Portugal. Like Nadia's talk about the situation in Spain, our economies remain strong at this moment. Last year, the Portuguese economy posted its strongest rate of growth in 35 years, 6.7%. We are firmly above our pre-pandemic output levels and in a solid path of convergence with the European average. This year has had a strong start and we are confident we can grow above 1%. Our labour market is in a strong position with participation rates in historical heights and highest number of employees on record. In 2022, we stood behind families and firms with an overall support package of close to 2.5% of GDP. We have kept a strong focus on a responsible manager of our public finances. Our deficit will fall to values be below 1.5% in 2022, and the public debt ratio will reduce by more than 10 percentage points to a level values below 115% of GDP, the lowest level in 11 years. For 2023, we have devised policies that assure most citizens with, increase, with income increase equal or higher, especially in the case of most vulnerable, than the expected inflation for the year. But make no mistake, there is no room for complacency. First, 2023 needs very close attention to face the challenges that we really have. Inflation is still high. The pain that was caused to, to several um, social strikes is still there. The economic growth, albeit positive, will be lower than 2022. The impacts of the monetary policy decisions on employment and disposable income and profits are increasing and need close monitoring. Second, ECB's gradual exit of the European debt markets requires particular attention as it creates pressures on European financial markets and on the overall European financing conditions, sovereigns included. In fact, this is one of the biggest challenges we face and the reason we, we put so much weight on the reduction of the weight of public debt and broaden investment base on sovereigns. Finally, while dealing with the many immediate changes, we must not lose the sight of opportunities and threats that are social model arising from other long-term trends. As Nadia said, we need to face together the structural challenges that climate change, new sources and energy supply concerns, demographic challenges, innovation, protectionism and nationalism pushing against globalization are powerful forces current at play. In the coming decades, we are likely to find ourselves in an environment where shocks are more, are more frequent, larger, and possibly more persistent. Ladies and gentlemen, to face current and future challenges, we need ambition, courage, and determination. In the economic and financial dimension, we need to work closely at least on three dimensions. First, assure sustainable public finances that can protect our monetary union and each of its members from future shocks, while assuring adequate levels of public investment. 
Second, industrial policies that actively promote Europe's competitiveness and innovation in the transition to a net zero economy. Th three, strengthening and deepening of our institutional setup, assuring a stronger union built on trust and credible commitments. In these regards, the review of the economic governance framework initiated by the European Commission is an opportunity for the Union. Simplification, increased transparency and effectiveness, greater national ownership, accountability and a stronger focus on public debt sustainability are all in need in the current fiscal framework. The Commission proposals offer positive contributions to address them. We should not waste this reform opportunity. Success in with, is within reach if we work together. To credibly commit to reduce the debt burden across Europe without jeopardizing investment and growth. Second, strike the proper balance between nationally adjusted fiscal trajectories on one hand and transparent rules that prevent dual standards within the Union on the other. In other words, we need equal treatment for all while admitting that different problems might require different solutions. Third, improve the framework in dimensions that go beyond the fiscal dimension at the national level. The several crises we have faced have proved that EU's policy coordination delivers. During the pandemic, under a common threat, we joined forces. Instead of yet another debate on solidarity and moral hazard, we created new European tools, in particular the SURE mechanism and the next generation EU. This experience demonstrated how common instruments of shared responsibility add value to national policies and do not generate, as some feared, reckless behavior by any member state. So, building on lessons learned, we should aim to create a permanent European budgetary capacity for strategic investments that may safeguard Europe's economic sovereignty as well as a permanent instrument of macroeconomic stabilization to face shocks. We cannot ignore the long-term challenges face the EU as a whole, including the need for increased public investment to facilitate the twin transition or the negative demographic evolution. We also cannot ignore the need to foster a deepening of the capital markets union and to continue building upon and leveraging the potential of our single market. This is the only way to contribute to convergence, to the level playing field and to great risk sharing. Ladies and gentlemen, the current discussion on the reform of the economic government is taking place in parallel with the debate on EU's response to the subsidy schemes implemented in other regions of the globe. The current geopolitical situation and the ongoing climate and digital transitions demand we take action aimed at reinforcing European competitiveness towards a prosper, net zero economy. This will require the mobilization of considerable financial resources that private investors alone cannot deliver. An effective European response should strive to achieve three main goals. One, ensuring that EU's manufacturing capacity is maintained. Second, attracting investment in green technologies and clean industries. Third, reinforcing incentives to innovation, particularly green innovation. An important challenge we faced in the European Union is how to promote the competitive European industry in the global market without detriment to the European single market itself. We can all agree that some degree of flexibility is necessary to allow for member states to provide public support, particularly in key sectors as green technologies, energies or digital industries. But it is essential that this support is not financed only by national resources. As fiscal space differs considerably between member states, such an approach would introduce undesirable imbalances to the level playing field within the Union and would raise the risk of economic fragmentation. Any flexibilization of state aid framework should therefore be temporary limited in scope and target to the sectors at risk of relocation, 
put in place the necessary safeguards to present increasing asymmetry and divergence within the European single market, go hand in hand with European funding instruments to support clean tech industry and net zero investments in the EU as a whole. It is critical to ensure a high level of synchronization between changes to state aid rules and steps forward and European funding of the required support to our economies. A process that to disconnect the two, rushing forward the first and postponing the second, would weaken the, un the Union. As Nadi put it brightly, the holistic approach is really needed. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now give room to our discussion, not before expressing my gratitude to Nadia and to wish her and her team a successful presidency of the Council on the second half of 2023. You will be steering these and other very important discussions and decisions. You can count on our full cooperation to achieve our common priorities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Minister. A wonderful speech. I agree from bottom to, uh, to the top of what you have said. Uh, first, uh, I will congratulate both of you for the clarity of the speech and the presentation. And above all, because I agree with you that both Portugal and Spain are in a much better position than were supposed just uh, one year or two years ago. And a much fair solution has been adopted. And even I think that the result of this is a stronger society, despite the polarization that we have. Therefore, the deficiency of your public policies has been really very, very, very big. I will keep in my mind something that you have said, Mr. Minister, that this is time of reform, and we are not in a position to lose the opportunity to make Europe better and stronger. I think this, uh, this is a key point. Uh, and the second idea that you raised, which is also very, very interesting, it's that instead of talking about solidarity or moral hazard, we need to try to develop institutions and procedures which are much more efficient and much more sustainable according to our, our world. I think these two, two ideas are very, very important. And I think maybe we can elaborate on these ideas of how we can implement in the three main ideas, three main topics that uh, both the vice, uh, vice, minister, vice minister and you, minister, have, uh, have raised. On the one hand, fiscal rules. On the second one, on uh, the response of Europe to our IRA and how these uh, uh, is an opportunity to Europe to try to reinforce industrial policies and make our uh, European Union uh, much more competitive, and although there, there is problem with the state aids. And maybe the third point, which from time to time is loose, in my opinion, of our conversation, and I think it's the real elephant in the room, and the real elephant in the room is how Europe is going to face and to, 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 to deal with the public, the European public good. How we, uh, how we are preparing ourselves for uh, trying to have a, a, a much better conceptual framework to deal with these uh, public goods which are really needed in Europe, climate change, defense expenditure, um, solidarity and uh, much uh, equal societies but we are still not in a position, in a clear position of knowing if this is going to be just financed by country states or we need something similar to next generation uh, funds and we need to, to deal in a, in, a European, in a European setting. Maybe we can, we can begin with fiscal rule if you want. Uh, fiscal rule, if I go to, to, to the proposal of the, of the Commission, which I see is that a very wide consensus is emerging. At least I have detected eight ideas which shows that we Europeans 
agree on how this fiscal rule has to be or not to be. On the one hand, that we need fiscal rules. On the second, that the old framework is not longer uh, effective and, and usable. The third, that the arbitrariness of the 3% of deficit and 60% uh, debt rule uh, is there. Fourth, that we need to eliminate the 120 uh, percent annual reduction in, in debt. Fifth, that uh, we need to require uh, that plans has, been, has to be adapted to the, con to the condition of uh, individual countries. Sixth, that we need fiscal adjustment to be accompanied by the structural reforms that increase productivity and growth, we finally learn. Seventh, the need for fiscal adjustment needs to be compatible with European investment needs. And here again, this idea of uh, public European goods uh, reappears. And finally, that we need to develop rules that are much simpler and has more social support than the previous one. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of consensus, but also we have some problems and maybe you can comment on how you will face these uh, disagreements uh, on how we, we go from here to having finally a uh, usable and efficient and fair fiscal rule mechanism. Maybe uh, Nadia or maybe Fernando? Uh, go ahead, oh. Fernando, no? We can... oh. Okay, I start. <laughs> Yes, because you, you spoke a bit more about this in your introductory remarks. So I was deliberately, deliberately, <laughs> very, very uh, general on, on all these issues. Well, uh, three points from my side. The first one is that I think it is indispensable to put this debate in the broader context. I really insist that the three points, fiscal rules, industrial policy, European public goods, are just some different aspects and facets of the uh, um, key question, which is how are we going to face current challenges and how are we going to fund the necessary public and private investments to drive uh, successfully the green and digital transition in the world. So, that's, so it has to be uh, put in, in context. I agree with 98% of what you said, Jose Juan. <laughs> in the sense that I think there is a unanimous agreement uh, around the, the table about uh, the fact that we are not in the same uh, situation or in the same context as we were before the pandemic. Uh, debt to GDP ratios have increased in all countries and therefore there is a, there is a different approach when it comes to setting targets and, and uh, automaticity from this point of view. I think there is a unanimous approach that we need to set new fiscal rules which are fit for purpose in the sense that they ensure that we continue to reduce our deficit and debt to GDP ratios in a manner which is growth friendly, in a manner which is compatible with growth and job creation and public investment, as, as Fernando was saying. And I think both Portugal and Spain are examples of countries that have, in the past two years, already absorbed a big share of the extra debt that was issued to respond to the pandemic in a manner compatible with growth and job creation. And so we, we can also show uh, the good balance in this debate. And I think from this point of view, there is a unanimous agreement also not to go back to the old trenches that were dividing, uh, creating cleavages and, and uh, uh, highlighting the cleavages between North and South and big and small, uh, new and old member states, East and West, you know this. I think that this is, this is uh, true. Now, problem is, devil is in the details. So I think that when we get down to the details, it's much more complicated to get uh, this unanimous agreement. I think that some very large and important member states have already expressed skepticism as to some of the proposals, which is just uh, the, uh, it, it just imposes, I think, on all of us to be realistic when we are approaching this debate. But I think that Portugal and Spain can together provide a very important drive to find the necessary uh, equilibrium uh, when in the second part of the, of the year we close a deal on the new fiscal rules because that is probably my main message and I'm sure Fernando agrees. We cannot linger 
we cannot let this aside. We cannot go back uh, automatically to the old rules before the, that we uh, were applying before the pandemic, because we were really not applying them uh, in, a, in a manner uh, which fulfilled what they were theoretically um, aiming for. And so I think they were not fit for purpose. Before the pandemic, they're even less so today. And so um, I think that probably what we will need to do uh, uh, in the coming weeks and in all the ECOFIN meetings is putting pressure so that we do not linger and that this debate comes to fruition under our presidency so that we can agree on the new rules before the end of the year. And so we have a new framework which is appropriate and sets the, the path for the coming decades uh, as of 2024. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Thank you uh, Nadia. Uh, I was precisely picking in, in, in the sentence that, uh, that what uh, one said in the beginning is that there is a lot of consensus. Uh, there is a lot of consensus in this side of the room. I don't know exactly if in the other side, but I can tell you that there is no consensus at all in the rooms that we are having in Brussels or in Luxembourg. Um, because the, the issue is that I think that we, 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 have, uh, we have the evidence of a very strong case of uh, what was a failure in global capacity of acting. It was the first years, first long years of the financial crisis. And it was Mario Draghi's and ECB that broke the the impasse that it was made at the Council's level. And we have at the same time what is one of the most remarkable success in public policy that I know that was the answer to the pandemic. Because in the pandemic, not only we coordinated between governments, we created new instruments, we thought about the current situation and about the future, and it was coordinated inside the European Union, in the Council, with the ECB, and worldwide. And, and we need to value this, because we need to take lessons from what we did amazingly well. It was a political achievement by... We, we jumped old prejudice about policy, about coordination, about member states. It was something like the, like the wrong action of the financial crisis answer, it was vindicated with the pandemic answers from the, co the coordination of the public policy. And we are here in a moment that we need to build that holistic approach that, that Nadia stressed very well, because the challenges need those approaches. And first of all, there is not a consensus that we need this holistic approach. And second, when we go deep inside of the three subjects that we have on the table, uh, we didn't find yet that consensus, and uh, we are trying to gather forces and strengths to move forward in that direction. Let me stress briefly the three. First, when we talk about the budgetary capacity to deal with shocks and to need with investment needs. Obviously, we have next generation EU. There is still a, a a significant part of the next generation EU that is not spent. And it's true when some countries say we don't need new instruments because we have still money to use. But it is not true that we not need structurally investment capacity for the goals that we have that are going to continue after next generation EU ends, 2026. So there is no consensus about in building this capacity. And we need to continue working on this, and we need to continue fostering and uh, giving strength to the argument, to, to the strong success that we had with the pandemic answer. Sure, is, a, is an amazing creation that we had. Next generation EU also. Uh, so we, we need to build on that. The second point is about the, uh, the fiscal rules. Uh, obviously, uh, I would not say that there is a consensus on that. It is not, uh, it would be, 
it would be not true. <laughs> and it would be a miracle to think that there is a consensus. Probably there, there we'll get to a consensus at the end of the road. But uh, I think there, there is a point that we agree, that is that sustainability should be on top of minds and less some small and rigid indicators that uh, are not, for instance, the rule of reducing one tenth of surplus on that, on that above 60%. I think there is a general sense that we could uh, replace that rule by uh, that sustainability analysis that is more rich and more and creates a more uh, credible path for reduction. But below that, we didn't reach yet an agreement on what the rules can imply and namely what's the room for investment and what's the rule of European funds to fund that investment. Because the issue is that if we don't have the holistic approach, if we say no to an European fund and to reinforcement of European mechanisms, the, the burden of financing the investment is going to rely on national states, on national governments. The capacity of making that is completely dependent on the debt analysis, on that path that we have, and on the investment capacity that rests. So thinking independently is not going to same to the same result. And the, the, the third part is the answer about the issue that is being put by the American administration that, uh, that is putting several changes, but we are, again, with the need of the holistic approach, because if we decided about uh, dealing with the package that Biden administration put forward in a basis that it's its country by itself, we are going to rely in one measure, that is suspending or lowering the requirements for state aid. But if we make that, obviously we can deal better with the American proposal, but we are going to create a lot of problems in the internal market and we are going to damage the states that have less budgetary capacity to invest and to give to their companies. So we are going to create probably bigger problems than the ones that we are trying to solve. So um, there is a big consensus here and we'll try to build the consensus on the other side on these three main areas that are uh, very important. And if not before, I hope and we'll work very thoroughly to make that on the, on the Spanish presidency. Much very clear, and I, I agree again. Uh, uh, the question here will be what can we do to try to build this uh, greater consensus in, uh, in Europe? How the society, how the think tanks, how the academy can help you to try to build this consensus? Because what is clear is both of you has been, been pointing out to, to the same thing. Uh, Vice President Nadia say uh, we are uh, in a process in which every chain is intervening and uh, has feedback from one place to the other. We are talking about governance and we are talking about a coherent new uh, European Union with all the constraints we know that to create that has on terms of consensus and rules and laws and treaties and all these things. But the pressure of the society, the pressure of the academia, the pressure of reason can help you. And maybe one question that we, we must ask ourselves is what we can do to try to get better rules and a better, a better governments. Uh, because I think uh, it's important what you, both of you were saying, that this is not trying to find out a solution for an ad hoc problem. This is how we create uh, a procedure, a European Union, which is able to deal now with the, the, the shocks we have now, but also with the shocks that are coming. How, how do you see the role of society, uh, academia, think tanks, helping you to do that? Oh. Well, I think, I think that you have a very important role to play together with the other think tanks in Europe. And I, my advice would be not to uh, get bogged down in the details, because at the end of the day, it's going to be a, a, a very political issue. 
And you were saying it, Fernando. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it's going to be a, a, a very political issue, which has, uh, um, which is based on what's going on in Europe, but most importantly, what's going on at national level. What I mean to say is that um, the, the best way for us to contribute to having a good debate and an agreement in the second part of the year is ensuring that we continue to reduce debt, reduce deficit, continue to have growth, job creation, and so that the environment uh, that, we, that we deploy the investments funded with the next generation EU funds in an efficient manner, that we show by example, you know, and that we show that it works. I think this is the most important um, argument when we are confronted with prejudices and fears, because at the end of the day, those, they, those countries that are more reluctant, they fear. They fear that they will not be disciplined. They fear that this is going to lead to an unsustainable euro, that we're going to have a, a more uncertain and a more tailor-made kind of framework, which provides, uh, which gives less uh, comfort and certainty and confidence. So I think that the most important message that you can convey is one of confidence in the uh, ability of a, a, a more uh, efficient and more updated um, and more adequate framework to actually contribute to a well-functioning Eurozone and a well-functioning uh, fiscal union. I think that that's probably, uh, you know, giving comfort and confidence is, is going to be a 80% of reaching an agreement in the second part of the year. And so I hope that we can have a continue on this positive path. You were referring to Fernando. I mean, in Spain, we have had two years of 5.5 GDP growth. Um, inflation has gone down uh, very fast. Job creation has record levels. We are at the record minimum of unemployment and youth unemployment. And we need to continue on this path because that's going to be the most convincing argument. We are disciplined, we fulfill our targets, as we have done in the past years, but this is compatible with growth and uh, prosperity. Uh, and, and the proof is in the pudding, no? to put it in a, in a nutshell. I strongly agree, I strongly agree with, uh, with Nadia. The, the, the issue is, uh, is to fight prejudice. Um, it's and, and and here the the think tanks and academia they have very very important roles, uh, beginning in the dialogue with their counterparts uh, in the other countries because the public opinion in those countries is obviously framed by academia by think tanks uh, and the, the political debate is framed by what emerges from those dimensions. Obviously, the, the political parties in, in every country, but uh, in those countries, uh, by sure, um, they, have, uh, they, 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 they flow the thoughts and the ideas and the data for major think tanks that are going to frame the position. And, um, and that is a role that only uh, uh, civil society and academia can make uh, because it's not a government saying, it's uh, something that we need to build and to build strongly with data. Um, because the last years had proven amazingly well. I have to, to insist in this point. It's very difficult. If you, if, if you look at pandemic uh, time, can, do, can you remember the speed that decisions were taken at European level? Can you see the amount of good decisions that were taken at European level? the level of economic coordination, the level of coordination in the Council, with the European Central Banks, with banks all around the world, with governments all around the world, to allow the, the world not to go in the most deep and dark recession that we'd have known. Mm. And it was a scenario in the beginning of a pandemic. When we see everything closed and stopped, from an economic point of view, is, is the room from disaster. But what we made, Altogether, it was a shift from private debt to public debt. We sustained capacity, huge investment and strong answer on supporting and finance technology and science that put us a vaccine much before than it was expected. And it was public money that was put in that. European, American, all over. 
raised public debts, created new instruments to finance th those investments. But at the end, we learned that cooperation and those types of instruments solved the, the countries and the world for a very dark place. And then what happened next is that the, the speed of recovery uh, after the pandemic, with some things that I think it was not expected by politicians at that time, for instance, the raise, the biggest raise on savings rates by families mm. that are supporting growth, they are still supporting growth. And they're hopefully going to continue supporting growth, although some of that has been cut by inflation. Uh, but there is some savings of that time. And at the same time, governments trying to reduce the burden of the, the, the levels of debt that they were obliged to, to, to make this operation. And in many of them, in ours, it's, it's, it, it is very successful, the work that we are making. So report this, this situation, the, the success that the collective action led to the creation of public instruments. There is, as Nadia said, no reason to fear. And uh, uh, once in a, in, a, in a council of ministers, in a, in a row group meeting, I had to say there is no reason for fear. Uh, it's the second year in a row that Portugal has a lower budget deficit than Germany. Uh, why worry? <laughs> he was—he was not. He didn't laugh. He didn't laugh when you said it. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Um, so, and uh, we are now with a public debt uh, level that is lower than before the pandemic. So, uh, building on that confidence. Obviously, this is a part that uh, everyone is engaged to make this fight. Obviously, we have a difficulty here in, at the European level. Is that? We, we proved that we could be very good when we have a common and the challenge that everyone faces uh, the same way, like the pandemic. Not financial crisis that was asymmetric. Uh, they thought that it was asymmetric in the beginning, then they realized that it was not. And now we need to, to make the case that it is real, that the challenges that we have, for instance, on energy investment, well, Central and Eastern Europe basically needed more to upgrade their systems that Portugal and Spain need. We need a lot of work together before. But it's a common challenge to make that transition on digital transition also. And we can, if we make the common case, I think we can get successful on that. Thank you very much, Minister. I have been informed that we have to come to a close with the ah. conversation. Uh, we have uh, gone beyond what has been uh, allocated. <laughs> and I think that has been really a pleasure to have you here, and I think very interesting points. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.